Oh my God, what a wonderful day this is. What a wonderful day this is. <laughs> well, I wanna say good afternoon. I am Dr. Tammy Robinson, and I'm serving now as your president of Mesa Community College. <laughs> I have to be careful because I do get emotional, so I try to be like really tough, and I am tough, but with, with things like this, monumental things, historical things, um, you do tend to get emotional, or I get emotional. So it's great to see all of you. Uh, we have about an hour together here, and then we have another social hour after this. So one of the things that I always stress is that every time we get together, let's make sure it's meaningful. So I have a few things I'd like to say and a few highlights I'd like to cover uh, for us today. But before I get started and I talk for an entire hour, which I won't, maybe I will, but m I won't, <laughs> I promise, because uh, I can, I can go. Those of you who know me know I can go. Uh, I want to introduce you to a former uh, Mesa Community College student and also a Mesa resident. Uh, she, uh, her name is Antoinette Colley. She is actually featured in our um, uh, art history museum or art history library. Ginger, Professor Ginger, are you here? Are you here? She sent me an email, and I want to thank you so much. Um, it, it was the definition of a community. Uh, I got an email probably my second week. Dr. Robinson, I want you to meet a former student of ours. She's a resident artist in Berlin. And her name is this, this is her artwork, love for you to meet her. So on one of my tours, I take tours because I'm really taking the time to get to know you. Now, and I always say, not just the buildings, because it's a beautiful campus, it's a beautiful neighborhood, but I really want to get to know all of you, you know? And so got a chance to meet Antoinette and meet with her virtually. And her story was so powerful, I don't want to go into all of the details, uh, but what I said to her was after uh, we met for about 30, it was supposed to be 30 minutes, but of course it's me again. So, um, you know, I think it went for about 45 minutes. Um, I wanted her to open for me. And I want her to open because it exhibits my theme of what we, I would like for us to really uh, do this year. And my theme is connectedness. And you're probably saying, what the hell is that? But connectedness, why? Because we have been so disconnected. We are working our best to get back together, to be a campus, but we have to understand too that being a campus and, and being connected looks different. And so first, I want Antoinette to just talk to you for about ten, five or 10 minutes, tell, tell you her story, because it is about each and every one of you and what you do for each and every student on this campus. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Antoinette Colley, a former or a alumni of Mesa Community College. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me? Dr. Robinson, can you nod if, if everyone can hear <laughs> yes, me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, okay. <laughs> Um, hello, everyone from Germany. Um, I would like to start by thanking Dr. Robinson for inviting me to share my story and a bit of my journey with MCC before she uh, delivers her welcome address. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you from afar. I was born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona. I grew up in a broken home, bouncing back and forth between my mother and father. It was a chaotic and unpredictable childhood. The only true consistency I had was art making. It grounded me and gave life meaning. And so I dove into it as early as kindergarten, often laying in bed with my mother, coloring and marveling at how she could keep her colors within the line. I never thought I'd be as good of a colorer as my mother. While I loved making art, being a part of a marginalized community meant that I had little to no access to find art resources, spaces, or supplies growing up. Being a Black American often means that things like art are seen as luxury items and pushed aside because our community is still in survival mode. Our community still suffers the consequences of racism through, uh, 
the consequences of slavery through systemic racism. And when you're in a constant state of survival mode, you don't have time or money in a lot of cases to truly dive into things like art or music. Luckily for me, my saving grace was a father who was a craftsman and would often build and create art projects with me at home, such as model cars or paintings. He would even end up helping me with some of my 3D design class projects at MCC, some of my favorites. Growing up and seeing my father consistently make art truly uh, normalized black art making on a subconscious level for me. Because of this, I was able to move more boldly and bravely and have less perceived uh, obstacles along my path. My father served as representation that a lot of society lacks today. In high school, I excelled quickly as a young artist. As a teenager, I would spend four to eight hours a day drawing, sometimes even in class or at my after school job. It was like a second heartbeat to me. I had advanced to a college level by the time I was a sophomore and started taking college level art courses when I was a junior. My high school art teacher, Mr. Cooper, once wrote me a recommendation letter for college and in it he said that I was set to become one of the greatest artists of my generation. Those words stuck with me. Even though I couldn't comprehend at the time the magnitude of what he was actually saying. Today, I believe him. And that belief started with the confidence I gained in college. When I first started at MCC, I remember the overwhelm of all of the paperwork and navigating financial aid and choosing the right courses. It's completely overwhelming. As a first generation college student, I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. I dove headfirst into fashion design because my father thought I would love it. I quickly realized that while I love to dress and get dolled up, I am absolutely not qualified or fit to make clothing for anyone or anything. <laughs> so naturally, I moved on to criminal justice. And to be honest, I absolutely loved criminal justice. I had every intention on becoming a forensic scientist and maybe one day working my way into being a forensic artist. That is until three semesters in, this little voice inside of me told me that I needed to be making art. I mean, after all, it really was the thing that meant the most to me in the world. This little voice had guided me my entire life. And so when it calls, I just go. And so I switched majors for the third time and began studying fine art with an emphasis in painting. While my drawing was beyond my years, my painting really needed work, and I was dedicated. I remember being pushed and challenged and stretched in ways beyond the skill set that I had brought with me. I was able to experiment and explore and expand in ways I didn't even know were possible. I especially remember my classes with Kai Kim and Ginger Leyendecker. They taught me what natural talent couldn't. They helped guide me to a greater level of art making. I remember when I entered the student art exhibition, I believe it was in 2012, the piece I had created was a painting done in one of Kai Kim's classes. And it was the marker of truly starting to find my voice as a creator. I remember Kai looking at the painting when I finished it. And she said, this is it, keep doing this. And I did, and I expanded upon it in the years to come. The technical skill that I gained uh, from my instructors at MCC is the reason that I am the artist that I am today. There is no Antoinette Colley without the instructors and courses I learned so much from. I took what I learned and applied it to my practice for many years to come. These techniques are what helped me set myself apart and find a dynamic and powerful way to use my voice. Outside of the skills that I acquired at MCC, I also had a life-changing experience when I studied abroad in Britain in 2010. When I arrived, I was in com complete awe. Um, I had never left the country before. You see, not only was I a first-generation college student, but I was the first to graduate high school in my immediate family. 
I consciously decided to break generational patterns, my choices, and that little voice had led me all the way across the world. It was overwhelming. It made me cry tears of joy because I had made such a huge dream come true and my college helped me. It was in those moments that I decided one day I'm gonna move to Europe. I had no idea that I would make that goal a reality 11 years later and land in Berlin, Germany. I was able to build a very successful career after college um, by applying what I learned in school with consistency and sheer determination. I wanted my dreams to come true as badly as I wanted to breathe, and they did. But it's so much bigger than me. I understood early on that my journey wouldn't be just my own. It would in fact be the journey of an entire city and one day beyond. I knew that I could serve as proof of what is possible. I needed to be the representation for little black girls like me and other people of color to show them what we are capable of. I knew it was my purpose to inspire and create a blueprint for my community. This is my mission and this is why I'm here. Currently, I have an art studio in Berlin that I opened after moving here to complete uh, an eight month artist residency. I've been living here for almost two years now, furthering my career. I recently created my um, last body of work titled Blackbird Fly, named after the famous Beatles song. Um, and after debuting this collection in Berlin, the, uh, the body of work then traveled to my hometown of Phoenix and it's currently on display at Gateway Community College, keeping it in the Maricopa family. <laughs> so it's on display through September 15th. I highly encourage all of you um, to go and see the work of a former MCC student and maybe learn a little bit more in depth about my story and my travels abroad. In closing, I would like to say that statistically, I shouldn't be here right now across the world speaking to all of you, but I am. I am because I was humble enough to learn, hungry enough to hustle, and wise enough to follow my heart. To all of the students who are struggling to find themselves or decide on a career, be patient and kind to yourself. You'll figure it out. All that matters is that you keep going and you trust the process no matter how uncomfortable it gets. To all of the professors and faculty pushing to make a difference in the lives of their students, I promise you are. Let me be an example of that. You make a difference every day in the lives of people like me who just need a little bit of guidance. And finally, to all of my former professors at MCC, thank you for pushing me. Thank you for encouraging me. And most of all, thank you for believing in me. Thank you, everyone. just need like a 30 second moment to just absorb that. Um, you can see after meeting her why I needed to, to bring her to all of you. You have to see the product of the hard work that's here at MCC. Today is about meeting me as the new president, but as I come and enter this room and this college, we have to continue to produce students like this. This is really the only reason we're here. We changed her complete trajectory. That's just one student. We changed tens and thousands of student lives, just like Antoinette Colley. I wanted to bring her here, not only to just show you black girl excellence, but I also wanted to give us all hope too. We hear a lot of bad news every day. We have, like I said, we are all still going through this pandemic. What, what does tomorrow look like? We're just trying to figure out our way. But I really, really wanted to take just a few minutes to highlight the excellence like an Anson and Kali. And also, you know, I wanted to highlight even, I have a few slides, not too many, I promise. Um, and the reason I'm do, showing the slides is because sometimes we forget about the, all the corners. We forget about the enrollment center. We forget about advising. 
Because once the students are in the classroom, we forget about how they start. So I just want to highlight just a few of the excellent pieces of work that are throughout this institution. All right? So that's me, of course. You see my theme. <laughs> Hello, that's me. <laughs> People say you look like your picture. Yeah, it's my picture, you guys, yeah. <laughs> You know, women get real sensitive about that. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you really mean? But anyway, let's go. Ne the next slide. Oh, I'm doing it. I'm, saying, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be. I think we already know I can't. I think we've already realized that I absolutely cannot do the clicker. Where'd I put it? Oh, no, it's right in front of me. Here you go. Juan, help. <laughs> I failed already <laughs> before I even get started. <clears throat> I, was, I said, I could do the clicker. I can talk and do the clicker and all. Okay, you see, I can't. All right, so you've already met our alumni, uh, Antoinette Colley. I really hope that you take the time to go to Gateway College. I'm going to make sure I do that to go and see her work. It is featured here. It is really showcasing uh, uh, black girls and black girls in the hood, giving it beauty and grace. And, you know, it is just wonderful work, you know? So let's keep going. Next slide. Uh, our, I have to highlight our athletic team. I walked around, I met the basketball team, women's and men's basketball teams, and as you can see here, we have 15 teams. We have 15 <laughs> sports. <laughs> and, and we've won uh, competitions in cross country, basketball, tennis, track and field. I hope as an institution we support our athletes. As a former athletic director, I lived, I was working in a small community where it would be filled because that's all we had was like, that's all we had. But, <laughs> you know, but even though there's more to do here, we still need to support our athletes. All right, so next slide. We have 33 athletes who earned academic awards and eight teams are honored. That's big. So let's support our teams. Next, we have the Mesa College Promise. And the Mesa College Promise, uh, we have an excellent philanthropic team from our foundation. Christoph is here. Where's Christoph? Raise your hand, Christoph. Working hard. We, the city of, and working hard with the city mayor, we raised $200,000 for our students to go to school for free. Excellent work. So thank you so much for that. We have 11 EVIT students who earned their high school diplomas and, and early childhood education certificates simultaneously. This is huge. It might not seem huge, but it's huge. Again, if we, if we dove deeply and probably uh, talked to each one of these students, we know that they have overcome so much to achieve this award. Next slide. I, uh, today, uh, we had the international student um, orientation. I went in and said hello to them. And so you see here, we have students participating in the Community College Initiative Program, 16 students from 10 different countries. Again, makes us doing great things. Uh, the Gilman Scholarship, I used to be over international students. Where's my international student? I bet they're not in here because they're doing an orientation right now. <laughs> if you don't know, let me tell you that, uh, that the Gilman Scholarship is the most prestigious scholarship uh, for, uh, for international students to travel. International student travel is something that's generally done by our white, more rich counterparts. But the Gilman Scholarship has uh, uh, made it so that it equalizes and equitizes the field. And it, what's amazing is that we have raised $34,000 and seven MCC students have been able to take part in this award. And that means that they're able to travel from either short-term travel or long-term travel, but they're able to get that. And it's comparable to our university counterparts. So that's a really, really excellent award. Please give them a round of applause. We have a new bachelor's degree program. We're, we're doing great things and we continue to do great things. We have two bachelor's degree programs and again we have a HLC team that's working with it. Dennis Mitchell is heading in and a few other folks, you know, and so we have going to have a bachelor's degree in early, early childhood education, dual language and applied and also a bachelor's of applied science and data analytics and programming. That is huge. What is that doing? That is equitizing the field of education, giving students a bachelor's degree that does not cost them $100,000 dollars okay <laughs> 
So we also have junior high and high school students who participated in early college programs. What is this doing? This is making education something that is spoken in all homes. When I did my doctoral uh, dissertation, one of the things I found was that my black and brown students who I surveyed for my, uh, for my uh, dissertation did not know where their parents went to college. How far did your parents go to high school or college? They go, mm, you know, they didn't know because sometimes that's not spoken in the home. So now what do we see? We have these early college programs where higher education is something that is now expected as it is in our white families, our white brothers and sisters, they talk about it. Our Asian brothers and sisters talk about it. So now we're saying that if you don't talk about it, we'll talk about it. We need to make college something that is more normal and acceptable, affordable, and it, again, make it more equitable. When they come here, are we ready for them? So this is an excellent program as well. And also, Thor's Day. You know, okay, I had to find out the Thunderbird was Thor. And that's our student life campaign. I actually do love the student colors. I try to wear something of the student colors every day. White today and blue. My light blue is my, is my school spirit. But I try to walk in school spirit every day. And sometimes you'll see me in my Converse nine days out of ten days or maybe 9.9 .9 days out of 10 days, I am in my red or white or blue Converse. And you know, I never did that before, but gosh, I love it. And it's hard, to, it's, hard it's gonna be hard for me to go back to pumps, you know, after this, but you know. <laughs> some people have never seen me in tennis shoes. You guys have only seen me in tennis shoes. <laughs> so we have 123 Thunderbird employees on the move. And what this means is, uh, is this is our new employees, right? that have started from since May, is that right, Marcy? Yes, so let's please give them a round of applause. And they've joined the Thunderbird team, moved up within the organization. That's really important. It's really important that we highlight that and welcome folks. And then we get to me. We get to me, we get to me, we get to me. <laughs> I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I know you're like, who's that? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My mom is like, she's like, oh my God. That's me at five years old. <laughs> five years old. That's Tammy Robinson as a kindergartner. Most people have never seen this picture. Um, I think this is important because this little girl here never thought she'd be a college president. Never. So my next slide, please go to the next slide, because then I get all choked up. So I'm a first generation college student, just as Antoinette. My mother dropped out of school in the ninth grade. She was actually taken out of school in the ninth grade. She went back and got her GED at 30 years old. And then she went on to get her associate's degree. And so she's still working, still substituting, you know. And so I lost my father at one, when I was one year old. He served in the Air Force and was, and was tragically killed. So, uh, and one generation later, uh, this is why education is so very important. One generation later, uh, my mother, um, who went through this very tragic background, her daughter is now a college president. So the next slide, please. This is my education, and most of you, of course, have read my bio, but I find as I walk around, some people don't even know who I am. They don't know I'm the president, so I, just when I thought I didn't have to introduce myself anymore, I realized I have to keep reintroducing myself, but that's okay. That's okay, because it's a great story. So I went to, I went to Cerritos College. I went to, for my undergrad, I mean, for my, part of my undergrad, I transferred into UCLA, where I got my bachelor's in uh, political science. I went on then to California State University, Dominguez Hills, where I I studied English uh, with an emphasis in rhetoric and composition, and then went on then to be a Dotri scholar, uh, whereas a Peter and Verna Dotri scholar at USC, where I got my doctorate in education with an emphasis in community college administration. I know that's really fast, but that's who I am. No need to keep, we're going to keep going. That's my trajectory. All right. So then we move on to MCC today. I think that it's really impossible Again, for me to talk about what we're going to do and the great work that we're going to do without mentioning what's our mission, what's our vision, what's our values. So our mission is we create an inclusive and vibrant learning community where everyone is supported to achieve success. And I can tell you from the moment that I stepped foot on this campus, that is what I've been seeing. 
I did a video last week about the new iPad program, and that iPad program is working with the OER program to bring, to make sure education is, of course, equitable. And we use that language, and we have to be sure that we don't get tired of it. We can't get tired of it. Why? Because it's bringing education to folks who never thought it was possible for them. You met Antoinette, I, I met Antoinette, and you also have met me. And so if these programs have been available, I wonder even, you know, how much more we could have even done. What about our vision? Inspire, ensure access, and empower action. That's what we do. That's why I love working with the philanthropic group uh, in institutional advancement. Why? Because we are out there in the community. We are knocking on doors. We are making sure that if anyone is in this community to help us and help our students and help our cause and help us with our mission and vision, they're on board. What are our values? We value our community. What I know from the data is that we have more people at this institution giving than any of the other nine colleges. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's pretty big, that's a pretty big one, that's a pretty big one, that's a pretty big one. We give, and let's continue that. You know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it can, again, that cannot be an afterthought. It cannot be something that we get tired of. We have to continue to push for diversity in the classroom, diversity amongst our workforce, diversity amongst who teaches our students, who serves our students. Leadership, leadership is so important. Uh, that's one of the biggest things that when I was candidate Robinson that I heard is we really need our president to stay a while. And I was like, well, how long? And they said 10 years. They said 10 years. Like, oh. They said 10 years. <laughs> I said, oh, gosh, okay. I said, okay. okay. I was like, wow, okay. I was like, y'all are serious about this. <laughs> All right, no problem. I'll do that. <laughs> But let's keep working. Continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is also really important. And also, let's lead with integrity. So um, also our strategic directions. I had the opportunity to work with Dennis Mitchell and go over our strategic plan. And with our strategic plan, we have a lot of work to do. We really do. We have, to, we have a lot of work to do as an institution. And because our number one thing is MCC is an agent for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And again, we have to look at that at all corners of our campus. What does that mean for your area? What does that mean in terms of us advance, being, uh, advancing our institution into the 21st century, into, into a time where we have to live with, you know, again, different variants, different whatever things are going on, we still have to keep going as an institution. Our goal number two for our wildly important goal is MCC improves student experiences and outcomes through guided pathways and guided pathway success. I know that there are folks who have been working on the guided pathways team for years, and so let's continue to support that work and see how we make sure that our students get through this process and this thing called education. But lastly, and something I want to emphasize in what I want to say to you is about MCC is a great place to work. You know, when I saw that metric, I was like, I don't know how to measure that one. I really don't. I want to be very honest with you. Because, you know, I could have had a bad day, like um, Carmen today came into work, and she said, I got here, and I was all excited. She said, then I realized I didn't have my laptop, so I had to turn around and go home. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was so cute. It was so, and, we, of course, we're just laughing, you know what I mean? Because we came over here early this morning for another meeting, and I walked over in my pumps in the heat, of course. That's why I did the cart this afternoon. I was like, oh, I did my walk already. Uh, <laughs> And what we found is the meeting was in the building that where we, wa where we were already. <laughs> and so, you know, that's not bad, but, you know, when, when you're walking in stilettos, every step counts. Every, and you don't want to waste a step. You don't want to waste a step. So my point is, is I could have said I had a bad day just because I had to walk extra, take a few extra steps in my stilettos, or I left my laptop at home. So let's work on what we mean by what that, what that really means. And there are some things that I have heard that to make this a great place to work. So again, um, I'd like to talk for a second about what my why is. Because we have to ask ourselves, what is our why? Why do we come to work every day? Why do we do this work five, 10? Everyone I meet says I was a student here. And then I started working here. And I've been here 25 and sometimes 30, 30 some years. I'm like, wow. So what's your why? Is it to change higher education? That's my, is, is that my why? Is it to continue to affect more students? Uh, the community, is it for me to defy the odds? And do I have something to prove? And I no longer have anything to prove anymore. I don't. <laughs> I don't. You see all those degrees? I have nothing to prove. 
And I have a 23-year-old daughter who always humble, humbles me. If you have children, it doesn't matter your title, you just mama to them. You know what I mean? They always humble you. All right? It's also relevant to keep in mind um, that I noticed early in my career, and I'm going to say this and I mean this, that I didn't dream big enough. I didn't. I came from such a poor background that all I wanted was to be married, have a house and a car. And at 31, 32, I had all that. And I looked around and I said, is this all there is? I mean, you know, I hate to be like that, but I was like, is this all there is? Because the husband isn't there anymore, you know? I've had several cars, so you can ladies know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know? You know, I digress. That's why I talk too much. But you know, this, I digress. I digress. But remember when we were little girls, you guys? This isn't in the speech, but I got to say it because I'm stupid like that. Uh, remember, what, remember how we were socialized? We were socialized to put Mrs. Every time you liked a guy in school, you put Mrs. something, something in front. Does anybody remember that? I know I did. I didn't plan out the wedding, but I was Mrs. Vincent Lofton. And I was Mrs. I was Mrs. whoever I liked. Because that's what we were socialized. That's how we were socialized to dream. We weren't socialized to be engineers. We weren't socialized to be the computer scientists. We weren't socialized to think we could be the college president or the doctor or the physician. We were socialized to take care of and nurture someone. And that was winning. And I'm not saying it's anything wrong with it. That's what you dream. But that can't be your only dream. So when I tell you that I stand before you saying that I didn't dream big enough, I didn't dream big enough because I didn't know what a bigger dream looked like. Having food in the refrigerator, having my lights on, having clothes that fit, that was, a pretty, that was pretty big. When Antoinette talked about being in survival mode, too many of our black and brown students are just surviving. Can I get a bus pass? Can I eat today? Can I get through school today? They can't think five years from now, 10 years from now. We asked them, what do you want to be in five years? Five years? I'm trying to get through today. So we help them dream bigger. We help them want bigger. And sometimes it's just because they met you and they don't even know who you are yet. They don't even know who they're fighting for yet. But that's why they come to us. So as you can see, Antoinette said that she was the first person in her family to graduate from high school. I needed you to hear that from her before I said it. Because I keep hearing that. Uh, earlier this week, I met with the superintendent of, of Mesa Public Schools. And so, and she was wonderful. And then afterwards, you know, I wanted a smoothie or something because it was 200 degrees outside. I was like, <laughs> I was like, Juan, I need something, you know. So we walked into a smoothie shop. And so I started talking to the young ladies behind the shop. And I said, well, where do you guys go to school? Because I just assumed they went to college. Because one, one lady who happened to be African-American was making, we were trying to figure out, because they had signs everywhere. It was so disjointed. And I was like, oh, God. You know, so we finally figured out which one we wanted. And so she said, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm a little distracted. I said, why are you distracted? She was like, there was, Metro was about to cut off my cell phone because I, I owed $6. <laughs> and I was like, girl, I would have given you $6. <laughs> you know, but when you're in that sort of, and then we asked her if she went to college, and she said, I didn't graduate high school. So then I, I keep hearing the numbers in Arizona, how high they are for students not doing something that we just think is just commonplace. But our goal then, too, is to make sure at least we graduate high school, and then we know that you make more money once you graduate college. So you at least need the skills and a certificate. So we still have work to do as a community, we still have work to do as a nation to be sure that people at least have a high school diploma. And also, too, I th I'm a strong believer in exploration. I loved what Antoinette was saying about how when she came, she really didn't know what she wanted to do. Because, you know, we started asking students in, at eight years old, what are you going to be when you grow up? You know, we all, you know, do we still ask kids that? What do you want to be when you grow up? We still try to figure out what we're going to be when we grow up. I mean, you know what I mean? We still, we're still achieving. You see, we got 123 people on the move. They still figure out what they're going to be when they grow up, right? But we ask little kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, fireman, I don't know. I don't know, doctor, lawyer, football player. They don't know. So if we could get them out of high school and help them dream, if we could let them come here and then decide they want to go into fashion 
and then, and then it's okay to switch to find your passion. You know, that's really okay, right? That's really okay. Everyone wins, everyone wins. One of my themes today, and when I talk about connectedness, my themes are grace, humility, love, and forgiveness. I went by that slide quickly because, you know, it's, it, that was my face up there and I can't take it, you know. So I'm like, come on with that picture. Let's go on to the next one, you know. But I, but I really, when I talk about the theme of connectedness, I really want us to really think about that because we have been so disconnected. It's not a bad thing because we survived. But again, we have to get out of survival mode too. And we have to get back into thriving mode. So when the first word that I wanted to talk about was grace. And what, what, what does that even mean, right? What does that even mean? And so when I think of grace, what I think of is when I've had some of my employees come up to me and say, you know, I'm sick today. Is it okay if I work from home? I don't know what happened before I got here. I just got here six weeks ago, right? So when I look at them, what I see is I need to be caring as a supervisor and as a president and as a, and a, and as a human being. I need to be caring and understanding that if someone gets sick and they're not, you know, and, and there's not something, they're still doing their work, that I needed to have grace and say, absolutely. Why? Because your health to me right now is more important than anything. We have to give each other grace. And we have to be leaders. Wherever we're standing, wherever we're sitting, we have to have grace. We have to give our students grace. I talked to the faculty this morning in the new faculty orientation. And part of what I was talking about was grace. Because when I went to school, if you were a minute late, they locked the door. And I think they thought that made us tougher. I don't know what the hell they thought it did. But <laughs> I don't know about you, but I didn't like that. Right? I didn't like that. And I told the story of when I was working on my doctorate in my first year, and I used to drive 50 miles one way to get to the institution. I was coming from Los Angeles, Hollywood. If anybody knows California, you know. And when I tell you that I was going to Claremont my first year, not USC, but my first year, you know that's far. And that's 50 miles. You know it'll take you an hour in LA to go 12 miles? Do y'all know that? You'll look at your GPS, you'll go, it's 12 miles. Why is it gonna take me an hour and 15 minutes? because you in LA, you know? So I drove 50 miles to, to when I started my doctoral program. And I gave myself three hours. Three, and sometimes three and a half, three hours to get to the class. And I would be sitting on the 10 and sitting on the freeway, sitting on the 60, whatever the hell, sit, just sitting there. And I'm like, oh my God, I've been in the same spot for like 45 minutes, I'm never gonna make it. So I remember walking into my class, and I was maybe 10 minutes late or something, and I, and I was so like, I found parking, I got, you know, I couldn't even get anything to drink, and I remember I sat down, and the professor looked at me, and he said, you're late. In a very judgmental way, you're late. And I'm gonna tell you, I did not like how that landed. I did not like how that landed. I had just leaped over tall buildings in a single bound. I had just sat in traffic in the heat. And you, all you could say to me was you're late. So there are times when we need to give students grace. And when I walked in late, the student, the professor could have easily said something that was a, a lot more, a lot nicer, a lot more human, and just said thank you for joining us. We're so glad to see, we're so glad you could make it tonight. Are you okay? Do we do that? When students are in our enrollment center, uh, you know, I got a chance to meet Warren. Where's Warren? I saw one, there's Warren. There's my enrollment center people, my outreach people. This doesn't work without them. None of this works. And I am a strong believer in the ecosystem of college because if they don't get through the beginnings, like the application, which is hard, I know, I know, we'll get there. I know, we're gonna talk about that later. Not today, no, not today, not today, not today. 
But if they don't get through the beginnings of uh, the enrollment and, and have a not, having, having a human greet them and say, hey, come over here, and if you need any help, just look up. We're right here. And then, you know, getting their classes. And Warren shared with me some glitches in, 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 in what someone may have thought would help students is now hurting students. But he felt confident enough to be able to tell his president, this is a problem, Madam President. And, I, you know, I don't know when you can address it, but I need you to know about it. So that as soon as you can, I'm going to need you to help me address this. And it's that passion that I saw from the advisors. And Lucy was in there. She got up and she started showing me around. And I know there's a level of pride when this African-American woman walks in, right? Because I am the first, right? So I know that she got up. She's like, oh my God, the president came through. And, and folks are like shocked when I come through. And I'm like, why are y'all shocked when I come through? <laughs> and part of it is I need to see you as much as you need to see me. I, this doesn't work without all of you. I'm one person, and I need all of you to make sure that we go forward. And so it was great to walk around and see the ecosystem of the enrollment center, where Andrew Stone, where's Andrew Stone as the dean? Where's, there he is, back there doing his work. Carmen in there giving out uh, snacks, and what's her name, Rita? Somebody was in there giving me Doritos. <laughs> Julia, was she giving me Doritos? I was so excited. I was like, I don't want people to think I'm taken away from the students. So she's like, oh, doctor, is this okay? I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Carmen, I'm just picking on Carmen today. But Carmen kept telling me funny stories this week. She was like, you know, you know, because people, because I had a few people who didn't know I was a president. I actually walked up to one person and she said to me, she says, oh, did you, are you new here? <laughs> I said, I said, yeah. I said, I am. I'm new. <laughs> and I said, and I said, actually, I'm the president. And she just kind of looked. She kind of got a little startled there for a second. And then Carmen tells me the story when she's handing out students, helping them out when she was a D. And she goes, Oh, don't worry. But the student said to her, Don't worry about that. You're just a water lady. <laughs> <laughs> and so the only commonality we have is they're women, and we're women of color. So we can't be anybody except the water lady and just a new employee. We can't be anybody really important on campus, right? So it's just funny. It's really, really funny. Because I want to move on to my next, uh, the next theme, which is humility. And what I'm talking about when I talk about grace, I also talk about the importance of humility, having humility. And again, I can lead with my titles and lead with all, the, all of this stuff, but at the same time, I am humbled to serve. And I know that all of you are humbled to serve, you know? And, you know, and when you think about, um, and Antoinette, Antoinette was very humble to tell her story to us today, to thank Professor Ginger and all those professors who helped her. And sometimes what I say too is, and she said it before I said it, you don't realize sometimes the kindness and just saying, how are you today, how far that goes. A high five, are you okay? Giving somebody some water, giving somebody some Doritos, saying there's a snack over there, taking the shame away from ha having to go to the food pantry, taking the shame away from needing an iPad because your family can't afford it, otherwise you can't go to school, taking the shame away from saying if you need clothes, we got clothes too. If you need tutoring, we have tutoring too. So we have to be humbled by the work that we do. Because I talk about Southern and Dobson, but I also want to talk about the love that I found when I was at Red Mountain. I was at Red Mountain my first week lost, right? I was sat down. I was like, I don't know where to go. And I kept looking at my phone, and I'm trying to figure out how to read my calendar. And I'm really, you know, really walking into the wall. But I don't want anybody to know. I don't know how to walk into the wall. I don't know where to park. I'm like, I don't know where to go. And I'm just, I just sat there. And who shows up but Cheryl? I don't know if Cheryl's here. Is Cheryl here? Sh Cheryl shows up. And she's like, oh, Dr. Robinson. And she takes me upstairs, and she gets me in the car, and she takes me around. And, and what I saw was love, right? And that's my next theme is love. What I saw was love, a love for a campus. And then there's Erica, who makes sure that I always have MCC swag. <laughs> Y'all know who I'm talking about over at Red Mountain. And so I brought it today, but I didn't wear it. Because I, I have it. I don't have it on because it jingles because I got my keys and everything on it. But I, I had a Maricopa lanyard. And I was happy with my Maricopa lanyard. I was like, she said, it doesn't have the MCC Thunderbird on it. So 
I'm gonna need you to switch that out, Dr. Robinson. I was like, okay. <laughs> and you know, I know how to follow instructions. <laughs> I switched it right out and put my Thunderbird lanyard on because I thought it was important because I love it, right? Uh, yesterday, uh, I, I don't know what we were doing, but um, Juan and I, would we, we just do our little strolls because he, he's realized he can't control me the way he wants to. <laughs> he puts it on the calendar and then it just doesn't happen. He, he wants me to go to six sites. We make it to two, you know, <laughs> and he keeps putting it on my calendar again and again, and we make it to like two again. So we went yesterday, we were in uh, the Dean of Enrollment building. So I saw where the deans are. And I want to highlight a person in particular, Pam. I think her name is Pam Harrison. And so we went in and we saw the veterans area. And Pam popped up and popped out. I said, oh, okay, who's this, right? Pam popped out of her office, and she's like, we need chairs. <laughs> this stuff is mix and, ma is mix and match. <laughs> I was like, okay, get, get into it, Pam. Get into it. <laughs> I said, you, I said I, you're going to make sure this is never show and tell when I show up, right? You're going to make sure it's never, this is not show and tell, Dr. Robinson. This is what we need. And so what I saw was love. You know, what I saw was that she loved her area. What I saw is that she wanted the best for it. And when she had an opportunity to speak to one of the leaders on the campus, she didn't waste it. She's like, this is what we need. And so I did say, did you ask for it though, Pam? And she's like, well, I said, Pam, you gotta ask. <laughs> you gotta ask. But I, but I heard her and I saw her. And so then I took a different eye. I'm like looking around. Now I'm critical. Like, you want me to be critical? Let's be critical. I was like, why are the walls green, Pam? Well, I mean, I'm, th this the whole thing. If our colors are red, navy blue, light blue, white, why is this office green? I'm just saying, now you want me to be Professor Robinson Tammy. Now I'm just wondering, how did, it, how did green ever get into the equation? She's like, I don't know. We're going to paint it, though. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. I want to take the time now to even thank our IT teams on campus who greeted me on my first day, Alvin Bridges. I don't know if Alvin's in here, but Alvin, everybody knows Alvin. <laughs> At least I do. <laughs> he makes sure that everything I need, I get. And he's like stealth. He just shows up. I'm like, where'd you come from? Where'd you come from? Where'd you come from? I don't even know where he comes from sometimes. I'm no good without Marcy and the institutional advancement team. I'm no good. I'm no good. I'm serious. Because as you can see, I have to be handled sometimes. Tam, Dr. Robbins, you know, it's okay if you call me Tammy. I, I really, you know, it's really okay. Because I'm always Dr. Robinson, whether you call me Tammy or not. <laughs> but, but Marcy will say, okay, Dr. Robinson, how do you want us to do this? Because <laughs> you keep doing this, but we, we really need some process and order. <laughs> I was like, okay, I see you, I hear you. And I appreciate that because I have a lot of great ideas and sometimes you have to be, you know, focused and corralled a little bit. And that's okay because that's why we have a team and that's why we all work together. Something else in the terms of love. Um, I, I want to move on from love, and I want to move on to um, my last theme, which is forgiveness. Uh, throughout, uh, when I was candidate Robinson and throughout my time here, my six weeks, what I've heard from a lot of you is pain. And so I'm very humorous and, and funny. That's just how my family is. That's just how we get through. But I do want to be serious for a moment because there's a lot of distrust. And I want to honor that. I don't want to sugarcoat that. I don't want to just jump over that and act like now that you have somebody new that, you don't, that I don't see it, I see it. And I want to apologize for the actions that are real that created that distrust. I have heard about some things that happened. Um, again, it happened before I got here. But once you're in the seat, it's time to deal with it. And part of dealing with any type of pain, however small, is to acknowledge that it exists and do better. Especially when you're in the leadership position and in a position to do better. So I've heard many things 
And first and foremost, what I want to do is just acknowledge that it's real and what you feel is real. And so what I'm hoping is that we can begin the process of forgiveness and the process to begin to trust each other again. Because all of the wonderful things that we do, we cannot do if we do not trust. All of the wonderful students that we need to help, we cannot do that if we don't trust each other, if we can't sit in a meeting together, if we can't sit in a room together, if we can't work together, cry together, laugh together, if we can't dissent. It's not about us agreeing all the time. Everyone in here has a different point of view. Everyone has, I want people at the table, why? Because I can't see it from a student services point of view. I can't see it from a somebody's point of view who's been here for 25 years and I've been here six minutes. I'm going to be short in, in what and how I see the world and how I see the issue. So it's so important that we respect each other's points of view, that we understand that each other's voices is important. It really is. So forgiveness for me is something that is really important when we're talking about connectedness. We cannot connect if we do not trust each other. So I really want us to continue to work on that. That's gonna take some time. That's not going to happen on Monday. But just know that I see it and we're going to address it. As I've toured the campus and the community, I also wanna thank Deanna Villanueva. You guys know Deanna? I wanna thank Deanna because she embodies love and grace and humility and all of it. She lives in the community and she absolutely loves the community and she wants anyone who will listen to help her community. And what she said to me was profound. She said, you know, she said, I bring leaders here, we look at the nonprofits and it has to go beyond a chicken dinner. It has to go beyond that. And she is absolutely correct that it must go beyond a chicken dinner. We also have to acknowledge that as an institution, we cannot do everything. We cannot serve every student's need. We have wonderful nonprofits that are out there. We need to be partnering with them, part partnering with them even more than we do. They need to know who we are, and they need to be sending students to, to us. I walked into a facility that I absolutely love, and it's called the I Can Center, I think. The Mesa Can Center, Mesa Can, I love that center because it's respectful. It's very respectful. It teaches students about, um, they have classes and job, job services. It also has the bottom floor, which is if they need help with utilities, help with rent, help with immunizations, anything they need help with, it's there. On the second floor, it has job placement and financial literacy. It has a clothing closet if you need a blazer or a skirt, if you need mascara or feminine products. It does so in a very respectful manner. But the one thing that was missing was us. The one thing that was missing on the sign was Mesa Community College wasn't there. And I'm like, what? How come we're not there? So again, I don't know what happened. I'm sure there's a story. But I really want us to be sure that we're there. So when students are taking classes there and they need help, they end up coming here and being a Mesa Community College student. So important. So important. I was going to tell you some other stories, but you know, I, you know, there's only so much time. There's only an hour, Dr. Robinson. You can't go on and on and on and on and on. I want to thank the office, my office of the president. I want to thank Juan Diarte. <laughs> Again, on my first day, we met in the parking lot at 7.30, you know, and the only reason I knew who he was is because Lori, and I want to thank your pre the previous president, Lori Berkwam, who was here for, I think, as your president for at least two years during the pandemic. I really want to thank her for her leadership and all of that. I want to thank Chancellor Stephen Gonzalez because he ultimately selected me, and I want to thank the Board of Governors because they ultimately ratified his selection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have to thank my family, my daughter. I have a 23-year-old daughter 
who is uh, very opinionated. If you have a 20-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old, <laughs> they are very opinionated. <laughs> you know this. She actually said last night she had just gotten back from a trip uh, supporting her girlfriend on her birthday, and she was like, Mom, I'm really proud of you. I know, that's what I said. I was like, <laughs> I must have finally done something right. I mean, finally. <laughs> yeah, I told you, your kids will humble you. Uh, my mom is extremely proud, extremely proud. Um, recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, I lost my uncle, uh, Clifford Davis. He's, uh, he moved here in his late 70s and to uh, Phoenix, uh, to uh, Queen Creek, and I've been staying with my aunt. So I want to thank my aunt, who has graciously accepted me into her home, uh, Elaine Davis. I want to thank her and honor her. because you have all made my transition a wonderful place and she has made this a wonderful place for me to be. And I have six brothers. I know you guys are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so when you have six brothers, uh, any of you, you know that they always prank you. And it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter your titles, it doesn't matter. They always figure out how to upset you and if you don't have a thick skin, you're not gonna make it. So they, 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 they took my, I remember one time I'd fallen asleep at the house and my oldest brother came and took a picture of me and then posted it. I said, are you kidding me? Why would you do that to me? And of course they just laugh and keep going, right? They don't even care. But it makes you thick skinned. It makes you, you, so you're able to really come out of anything. So again, having, I have three older brothers and three younger brothers. So all of that informs who I am. It makes me stronger. It makes me, t it makes me not, t I'm still a crybaby, but it makes me be able to get through situations um, without so much. A couple of years ago, I lost um, another uncle uh, who I considered like my dad. I lost him, he was a Vietnam um, veteran, Vietnam War veteran, and he actually uh, succumbed to Agent Orange. And he had Agent Orange that didn't appear for like years, 30 years, 40 years. And then finally he did pass, and he would have been sitting in the audience uh, on my first Welcome Day speech had he survived. So I wanna honor him uh, as well. I wanna honor his wife, Pat Patricia Page, uh, she is still uh, very much a strong part of my life, and, um, you know, and I'm very proud that he married someone so wonderful so that she can continue to be a part of, a part of my life. And uh, because it is important as an African-American woman that we do call on our ancestors. Uh, my, my past, and we, and we talk about our stories, we talk about our journeys, because what we know is there are so many people who died and bled so that we could be in the positions that we're in. So we, I never like for anything that I do to be lost on that. And so it's, it's of course very humbling to be your, your, your new president. Uh, I want us to continue to work hard. And when I say that, uh, that the theme for me is, is being connected and connectedness, that is something that I hope that we all embrace because it will have many different meanings depending on where you are. But for the most part, again, what I'm saying is I want to be connected to all of you. I want to be connected to the community and I want to work hard. So again, I'm going to stop there and I say go Thunderbirds and I am so happy to be part of this Mesa Community College family. Thank you.